First of all, I just want to thank the uh, conference organizer and the tech people. I really appreciate your help and with my little short video since quite nerve wracking the whole morning <laughs> and uh, you guys did a great job. And as communication scholars and practitioners, I think most of you would agree that we are all in part of the persuasion industry. And I just want to say that we are pretty impressed about the conference. So. Um, I'm going to talk about digital storytelling as a PR tactic that could be used um, in internal communication for organizations, both for grassroots, nonprofit organizations, but also corporate, um, public service, public sector organizations. And the organization I'm look, I, I myself, this particular study looked at, is an organization that so far I haven't heard anybody talking about uh, that particular category, which is nonprofit and grassroots. So I'm going to introduce um, very quickly what is digital storytelling as a practice and some of the emerging theories. I won't um, go over too much. And then I would talk about the case study, which was a um, study I conducted a few years ago in California. And we got a grant from a um, um, funding agency and working with a nonprofit grassroots immigrant organization. So it was a case study and ethnographic research was the kind of methodology I adopted. And of course, um, the latter part would be the implications on organizational identity construction and internal communication. So in a nutshell, um, with the technology being more and more available and, and democratizing, Common people, lay persons, can take up digital editing um, softwares and begin to make their digital stories. But here, uh, I'm talking about a particular kind of digital storytelling with a particular kind of approach and method. So it was supported by and promoted by this particular organization called the Center for Digital Storytelling in California, um, in the Bay Area. What they do is they organize workshops and they go into different corporates and um, um, community organizations, schools, to teach people how to use digital um, tools, but make stories of a particular kind. For example, a conversational storytelling is being preferred, not documentary, not professional persons giving a kind of narration over you know, interviews and stories, storytelling. And also, the point is that you, ha you want to be emotional. You want to really make a kind of you know, dramatic story that you, you will make to move people. That's the whole point. But it's difficult because you know, the length normally is five to eight minutes. So in the script writing process, it's quite hard because you want to make people, especially a lot of people who, who have not thought about telling stories of their lives or who are so used to technical writings or you know, writings for academic papers, it's really hard to be emotional and involving and, and making a story that short. So it really requires a particular kind of facilitation. And everywhere you go as a facilitator, you might encounter different problems, especially with older generations or, generation, or people who are marginalized and they may not be very savvy in terms of using media technology. But the promise is, as young people becoming more and more accustomed to using digital technology, they are the digital natives. So um, it has been adopted in a lot of European countries, actually, in uh, uh, Scandinavian, Scandinavian countries, uh, digital storytelling used for youth and young people. But here, I want to talk about, uh, well, yeah, this is the organization. And a lot of other organizations like the BBC and different kinds of uh, international organizations or local organizations have adopted this particular way for whatever purposes. And it's interesting because people have, um, very few scholars have studied um, digital storytelling using this particular kind of methodology. Some of them, um, actually only one, did it did a dissertation on using digital, digital storytelling for adult education. Um, and uh, other ones were talking about how youth were using it for projecting their identity, their image. But um, um, here, what I'm dealing with, this is the one in the middle, in American um, Culture Society, uh, Culture, <laughs> American Chinese Culture Association. Um, that's a nonprofit um, immigrant organization located in Los Angeles. And uh, I was privileged enough to be working with them for two years on this project. But uh, we got a grant from California Council for the Humanities. They gave grant to 
community groups and people in the community to tell, to tell stories of their lives. Being a state that is very diverse with people from all you know, different kind of cultural, ethnic, and race background, it's important to uh, bring the stories to a larger audience. So you, using the terminology of PR, CC, CC, CCH, our funding agency, has the intention of um, making the organization conducting external communication. So they want ACCA to produce stories and reaching out to other communities. But for ACCA, mostly through my own working with them, I feel like they want to use whatever opportunity to, to grow as an organization, to learn to be civic, to be more powerful, well-connected, and recognized. And my own take is more the research, research approach, working as an ethnographer and a media facilitator to know how people you know, use this technology and this particular kind of uh, methodology. And, um, Especially, I come from a health communication background. So we conduct media campaigns as media interventions so that to, in hope of pr pushing for social change. But using a PR lingo, it would be um, using media tactics in order to achieve specific strategic goals uh, by organizations. So I wouldn't go into too much of the whole, you know, um, entering into the mo uh, and mobilizing people and how to you know, make them more involved. But I want to say that during the production session, um, we have a very informal meetings, and uh, people, storytellers or not, in the same organization would come together and commenting on each other. There's definitely collective editorial decision making that goes on. And uh, very often, very narcissistic stories are just being pushed <laughs> to the side because you know, this is not the platform for you to just say how great I am and how beautiful I am, whatever. And of course, we did fulfill our um, mandate. So we had a reception um, that was held in a local li uh, bookstore for four days. And uh, we did bring stories to different communities. And that's where the problem came. Because, because people did not really respond as we expected. We went to this Mormon um, church women. And uh, they only talk about, you know, um, uh, birth control in China and uh, cultural revolution. We didn't really talking about, you know, what we were hoping dialogues that, that would bridge in different uh, people from different identities and uh, backgrounds. So I started thinking, you know, how can we make sense of this? We did do a very good publicity, and um, um, how can we make sense of it if if the external part didn't really work that well? Maybe the internal part, and in fact, it is the internal communication part that's you know, more significant. So these are some of my research questions, but um, I want to focus on, you know, the concept of empowerment, because in health communication, empowerment is used so um, uh, commonly, but, but it's hard to kind of really pin down people what is empowerment really means. But of course, there's literature in narrative um, in empowerment, narrative stu studies. Um, I also focus on participatory communication, where you really engage in the people who are not experts. Um, and I, I, from what I found, I, I realized you know, organizational identity and legitimacy are some important concepts that I have to bring into the discussion. Um, methodology, some of the stories are like this, are sing, some are single authors, some co-authored, um, and there are, you know, these are co-authored stories. Basically, stories try to exhibit these kind of you know, normative values that resemble the American discourse about race and multiculturalism. And um, um, I found during those um, discussion sessions that there is a clear direction to forge a narrative synergy where people try to make sure what kind of stories are told, what are not told, how do we present ourselves, controlling our identity and our organizational identity. Um, especially these two are made by the managers of the organization and they were trying to come up you know, a little bit de detached, not their autobiographic stories, but stories about the organization, about the community at large. So, um, and interestingly, because of this process, I found that there's this spatial reference being used. They start talking about them as, you know, particular uh, group in Los Angeles, and kind of neighborhood uh, a concept is being, uh, identity being infused into the organizational identity. And um, 
I learned from the managers that they really want to push the organization more outward, more going out, more civic, even though a lot of um, um, members do want to maintain a kind of inward looking and like a, like a club, you know, we support each other. But during the process, the, pro the, the transformation actually was transformed, uh, accelerated, because it's really needed for people to realize when we present these stories to the outside world, um, what exactly we are as an organization. And as a product, all these stories are cultural assets, using the words of the participants, that could be used for exchange. And um, um, participants had a very strong sense of empowerment, because these stories are an authorial device that will make their voice heard. I have quotes, but I don't have time to, to share with you. Some of the implication on PR, I feel like the relationship between a consultant and their client actually equals to an applied anthropologist and the natives. Um, I myself kind of played the role on the right, but now I'm, I'm, I, I felt like the whole time I was a PR consultant under the skin of a anthropologist, because my advisor would be happy to hear that. Uh, but what I, I want to emphasize is these kind of um, um, very nuanced understanding of consultancy or the role of a consultant when you play, especially when you deal with resource poor organizations and maybe in the resource rich organization but the resource poor part of the organization, very often the members um, whose voice are not often um, elicited or um, being uh, put onto a platform to a larger audience. So, um, some of the limitations of future research, I think I'll just stop here so that you all have a good lunch without being feeling hungry for too long. Thank you.